place it on your heart to clap your hands? Clap. I know that y'all have rhythm. I've seen it. I've seen it. But it's not about the rhythm. It's about the action. So if you, if you need to clap your hands, clap your hands. If you need to dance, dance. Eric, if you need to do backflips down the middle, I'll do it. Whatever needs to be done, don't be afraid to move in the Holy Spirit. God bless you all. Hey, good morning, everybody. How many of you happy to be here? Just lift your hand and say, that's me. Come on, put your hands together like Scott said. Let's give God some good praise this morning. He's worthy. Okay, we'll get there. <laughs> Let's have a wonderful day. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. No other name I know. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. No other name.
if you've got a praise this morning, just lift your hands and say, Pray, every praise to our God. Every word, that's it, come on. Bless your name, Jesus. Every praise, every praise.
How many of you would be honest this morning? Just lift your hands up and say, I need God to do something for me in my life today. Yeah, all right. Come on, that's the first step right there. Just lift up those hands. Well, right here in his presence is where your need gets met. Pastor Scott can come pray for you and lay hands on you until you got knots on your head. But until you make a decision and you decide that you're going to lay it down and give it to the Lord, he will move on your behalf this morning. I'm here to encourage you, no matter what it is that you're going through, that you need this morning, God is able. He's here for somebody this morning. Come on, this altar is open. If you just want to come and pray, just come and pray. If you just want to come and give God some praise all by yourself, come and do that. But just be encouraged this morning that God is able. He loves you. Oh, oh, oh. I can't change songs right now. We're out in the middle of oh.
healer, dedication, be set free this morning.
Come on, last time, every hand in this building lifted. Lord, we thank you, God, for your presence that you sent here thank this morning. You, Lord, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for all the miraculous things that you've already done here today. Lord, you can do more in five minutes than we can do in a lifetime. Amen. And Lord, when we get out of the way and we give reverence to you, God, and we let you have your way. And Lord, we step out in faith, God, and we come to you expecting and believing to receive. That, Lord, you make a way for everyone in this building this morning, every heart and every situation. And, Lord, we can't thank you enough, God. We give you glory. We give you honor. And we give you praise, God. I thank you, Lord, for touching this place this morning, for coming down and dwelling with us and being with us. And, Lord, as we move forward in this service, God, we give you all control. We give you all authority, God. You lead, you guide, and you direct us. And, Lord, we will go and we will say and we will be what you need us to be. And praise your wonderful name, God. We thank you. Come on, everybody, put your hands together and give God a good praise. Hallelujah to your name, Lord. You're worthy. Glory, honor, and praise. Those are three words that we use all the time about, about our relationship with God. Feel free to have a seat. Glory, honor, and praise. We want to bring glory to His name. We want to bring honor to His name. We want to praise Him for the things that He's done in our lives. Elders, if you'll please come to the front. That's exactly what your tithe and your offering is. Your tithe and your offering is glory, honor, and praise. How do we glorify God through tithe? Well, we've talked about it. Tithe is more than just a, 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 a flippant monetary dropping of a bill or dropping of a check into a bowl. That's not what it's about. You've been blessed with way more than money. You've been blessed with a skill set to have a job. You've been blessed with happiness. You've been blessed with joy. You've been blessed with peace. You've been blessed with understanding. You've been blessed with knowledge. You've been blessed with all of these things. So you share these things within God's kingdom. Your tithes should not be tied to your billfold. Your tithes should be tied to your entire life. And it should be a daily pouring out of the things that God has given you. So how do we glorify God through that? We glorify God by giving Him credit. Thank you, Lord. You gave me the ability to do this. Here is a portion back for your kingdom, Lord. You have more than sustained me. You have, as a matter of fact, you have overfilled me. You have overfilled me. We glorify God. Through that, we bring honor to his name by the fact that we are willing to give back to his kingdom. We are giving honor to him when we give back to his kingdom. It's, it's, it's an honor to give back to the Lord. There's no greater thank you because that's all it is. It's not a, a repayment. If you want to repay the Lord for everything he's done in your life, you're going to fail miserably. You're going to fail miserably. So as you tithe today, understand that it's not just today. We see what happens when we pour out the things of the Lord among those who may not know him or when we pour it out into society. We see what happens. And on the flip side, we see what happens when we pour out the things that are not of the Lord. Let's be cognizant of what we're tithing, and what we're giving back. When you leave these walls, what is it that you give each and every day? Are you giving yourself? Are you giving a bad attitude? Are you giving, are you giving bad gifts to those around you? Think about the stress and the hurt, the anxiety that you might be causing the person that is around you, the person that you are, you are trying to say that you are trying to help, the person that you are saying that you are trying to bring into a place of restoration. Here's the, here's the, the shocker. It's not you. Come on, brother. You can't bring them to that place, but you can share the gifts that God has given you to help him put them in that place. Give what God has given you. Don't give yourself because yourself is not going to do it. So as we tithe today, do so knowing what you're doing. Do so, go into it today knowing that you're doing it to thank God, not to repay God. Go into it knowing that this is not a shakedown. This is not a, a, a way to, to milk anyone of funds. This is a way in which we show the Lord how much we love Him and how much we appreciate what He has given us. If you don't appreciate the Lord and you're not giving for that reason, I would rather you take it and put it back in your pocket. 
We are here to glorify and honor the Lord. We are not here to make a statement or a symbol. I don't care what you drop in there. I've seen people pull wads of hundreds out and make sure the entire congregation saw them do it. It was like, it was like they, their arm couldn't go straight out. It had to go in their pocket and it had to go up and then it had to go out. And then everyone's like, oh wow, look at him dropping that wad of hundreds. A lot of hundreds, it's useless to God. God doesn't need your hundreds. If God needs it and if you need it, God will give it to you. Now, I'm not going to say that these funds, they don't go to help people in need. But if they're given with the wrong purpose and the wrong intent, God does not honor those things. Church is not where you come to look like a big shot. Church is where you come to be a member of a flock. Church is where you come to repent. Church is where you come to, to humble yourself before the one that is greater than you. So as we do this, let's humble ourselves. Let's thank the Lord. And let's give with a pure heart. Let's give with a cheerful heart. Knowing that what we are given is pleasing. Because we desire to be pleasing to the one true God. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we receive this tithe and offering today, Lord, I pray that you bless each and every individual here. As they pour out, may you pour more out upon them, Lord. May they receive that. May they know that that is where it is from, Lord. It is from you, and you are doing it out of love, out of grace, and out of mercy, because we are entitled to nothing. We are not entitled to your grace. We are not entitled to your love. You have given it because you love us, Lord. Let us be thankful for that love. Let us honor you because of your greatness, Lord. Lord, we give today with a cheerful heart, knowing that there is no way that we will ever outgive the mighty I am. And that if we truly give the things that are ailing us to you, you will return them, restore, and we will be fulfilled. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen.
stand up. Okay. You know what? Today's sermon. Well, first off, I'm going to say this. Next week, I'm going to start something that I never do. I, I, well, I've done it one time, but uh, I usually don't do series. But the Lord has really laid it on my heart to start a series next week on biblical prophecy. Because I keep on hearing that the world is in me. I don't know. I, it was supposed to end last month, according to one pastor. And another pastor has it ending next month. So I figured I'd get the sermon in before next month, before the world ends, you know. Uh, truth of the matter is, Jesus Christ tells us that no one knows when that day is going to be. So I feel like we need to look at that and we need to, to stand in truth. Because a lot of times we hear things and they can be convincing. I mean, a lot of snorting and a lot of slapping and a lot of all that stuff is convincing because he feels like they're convicted. But I'd rather sit down and I'd rather talk about it. But you know what's funny is I was going to start that series today. I've got the first sermon already mapped out. I already know what it's going to be. And uh, I've really got something else that I, I feel like I need to share. And as I share it, I'm going to look around today because I'm going to see a lot of people squirming in their seats. I love these sermons. These are the best ones. These are the ones that you know are going to touch someone. Why? Because it touched me as I was, as I was reading, as I was studying, as I was getting prepared for it. Because there, there's certain aspects of our lives. And I mean, show some hands. I want to see the truth. I want to see how truthful y'all are. How many of y'all have given everything that you've got to God? All right, that's a good truthful answer. That's a good truthful answer. How many of y'all still have a couple of things that you're holding back? Yep. Yep, 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 yep. Everyone does. Everyone does. We can all say, I've given it all to God. I've given it all to God. But the truth of the matter is there is something that we're holding on to in certain things that just aren't comfortable sometimes to give to God, you know? Because you think that you you think that God might not like it or you think that you might receive some type of punishment. So I'm just going to hold this away from God. The truth of the matter is God knows. God knows. One of those things that we, that we hold back in, in most general instances is our money, right? God has no place in finance. Oh, well, yes, he does. Yes, he does. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Today I'm going to talk about relationships. Mm. And I'm not talking about relationships like friendships and pastoral relationships and things like that. I'm going to talk about relationships between man and woman because those are important relationships and those relationships can shape our entire lives. The relationships that we have truly define the direction that we can go in God, go with God in many, many instances. So as we read through scripture, we, use, we see the example of yoking used Quite often. How many of y'all grew up on a farm? Yeah, I spent some summers on the farm myself. So I understand what yoking is, but it's not something that we see in today's society. You see, yoking is the bringing together, the tying together of two animals or more animals in order that they may accomplish a job. A lot of times what you would see, like when you see Christ say, my yoke is light, you know, what he's saying is he's saying, I'm experienced, you're inexperienced, I'll do the work. And oftentimes, that's how they did it, is they would take the young oxen and they would yoke them to an older oxen who has been through it, who has, who has done the job, and that older oxen was stronger. And what would happen is he, that oxen would pull the young oxen along in a straight line until it was trained. And that young oxen would be able to go. But the key word is that they would take a older and experienced oxen and yoke it to a younger and experienced oxen. So what was happening is they were actually training that oxen. Now, I'm going to start off with a story from 1 Samuel. Now, in 1 Samuel, what's going on right here so that we have a bit of context is Israel was very disobedient in these days. They were idolaters, they were doing the things that were not pleasing to God, and they went into war with the Canaanites, and the Canaanites captured the Ark of the Covenant, because Israel was, was pompous enough to believe, you know what, they've got a stronger army, they're better than us, but we're going to bring the Ark of the Covenant down here, and we'll automatically win. Two things. The Ark of the Covenant was not what was important, it was God's will that was important, so the Ark of the Covenant was powerless, the Ark of the Covenant got caught. Now, the Canaanites, what they did was they put it before their idols. Their idols fell over. Their idols lost their heads. Their idols lost their hands. Their idols were powerless. And the Canaanites were like, oh, this is awful. Let's send this Ark of the Covenant back 
to the Israelites. But what they did in order to send it back to make sure that it was of the Lord, that it was not just, you know, us sending it back to make sure that it was within God's will to be sent back is they did this. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, starting with verse 10, the men did so and took two milk cows and yoked them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. And they put the ark of the Lord on the cart and the box with the golden mice and images of their tumors. They made images of mice and tumors and put it in there. Pure gold, pure gold. Sending it back with some presents. And they said, and the cows went straight in the direction of Beth Shemesh, along one highway, lowing as they went. See, the th reason that this was remarkable is they took two milk cows. They didn't take a calf and they didn't take a milk cow. They didn't take a bull and a calf. They took two milk cow cows and they went in the same direction. That's the thing that was so amazing about that. Remember when we talked about yoking with the older and the younger, the inexperienced with the experienced? These are two milk cows who were experienced. They were set in their ways. And the fact that both of them went in the same direction was a miracle. Was a miracle. So here is the first part of what I want to say about who you yoke yourself to. If you are yoking yourself to someone thinking that you are going to bring them up and they are already set in their ways and they are already experienced, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're not going to change anyone. That is something that, that, that people prey on, men and women alike who are trying to, to con people, who are trying to milk people out of money, is they find people that think that they can fix them and they use them and they milk them. So if you think that you can fix, if you think that you can train, if you think that you are the one that's going to take this person from where they've been their entire lives and you're going to put them in a new place because of your greatness, it ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. So you want to yoke yourself to someone that has the beliefs, has the abilities, and has the strength that you have. So now that leaves us in a conundrum because everyone has problems. Everyone has a past. And that is very true. That is. That is very true. But the first thing is you don't want to yoke yourself. If you are a believer in Christ, you don't want to yoke yourself to a non-believer. The first question that I ask before I do a wedding is I say, do you both believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? If one of them says no, I say, I can't marry you. You have to have that commonality. You remember when I said that you couldn't fix each other? See, if you have a belief in Jesus Christ and you share that common bond, then what happens is you have a, a cornerstone of that relationship and you have a place where change can be made. You have the fixer in your relationship. So I want to read two sections of scripture here. The first one is about a man and the second one is about a woman. Now, the first piece is from Titus chapter 1. This is a piece of scripture that we use when we, uh, when we install our elders. Okay? And it, 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 it goes forth with the qualifications of an elder. But the thing about it is... Every single man, every single male in the church should be qualified to be an elder. See, we, we we're like, oh, well, these are impossible things to live up to. No, this is what a man of God looks like. This is what a man of God should be. So as this is written and as this is read, we see that Paul is saying, in order to be an elder, you have to be a man of God. That's all he's saying. He's saying the person that you put in with the church needs to be a man of God. He cannot be a pagan. He cannot be an idolater. He cannot be a, a, a womanizer. He cannot be an adulterer. He cannot be a liar. He cannot be a thief. He cannot be any of these things. He needs to be a man of God. But if we're in the church, if we claim Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, if we say, I'm giving my life to you, then we should be these things anyway. But Paul, just like your pastor and just like many other pastors, realize that not everyone is what they say they are. 
So women, as you are looking for someone to share your life with, look for these traits. Look for these things so that you know that the man that you are yoking yourself to is what he claims to be. Now, I think and I pray that I fit this description. But do I fit this description 100% of the time? No, I stumble. I mess up. But the character, this is what the man's character should look like. A man of God, his character should be as follows. It says, if anyone is above reproach and the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright and holy, disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction and in sound doctrine to rebuke those who contradict it. I mean, does that sound like anything that a man shouldn't be? That is exactly what a man should be. Does that mean that every man is there right now? No. Does it mean that every believer is there right now? No. We're all at different places in that uh, sanctification process. But that as a man should be our goal. And as a woman, that should be the goal for your husband. That is what your husband should look like. The person that you are going to tie yourself to, the person that you are going to yoke yourself to, that is what he should look like. And why should he look like that? Why can't it be the guy that's slinging rock on the corner? Why can't it be the guy that has three other side women? Why can't it be the, the guy that's just with you because you look good? Why can't it be the guy that, that's lying to you about his money? Why can't it be the guy that is contradictory to that? It can't be the guy that's contradictory to that because the guy that's contradictory to that will not be able to see you through your problems. He will not be able to truly support you when you are in need. He will not be able to be there for a family. He will not be able to answer the questions that your kids have about Jesus Christ. He will not be able to be truthful when it truly comes down to it. He will not be able to be the man that you need him to be if you are a woman of God. It is very important who we yoke ourselves to. It's important. See, and we allow things to get in the way of that. We allow things such as physical attraction, money, accessibility, ease. That's a big one. That's a big one. A lot of people are with someone just because it's easy. Why are you with this person? It's easier than breaking up with them. Y'all laughed. How many of y'all been in that relationship? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Wake up four years later, you're like, man, this is awful. <laughs> yeah. See, but if we, if we take that, what we do is we end up finding a man or a woman that loves us for us. Women, if you find that man, that man is not after you just for your body. If you find that, that man is not after you just for your money. That man is not just after you because it's easy and that man is not after you just because it's convenient. That man is after you because he truly loves you and he feels like the Lord has laid on his heart that he needs to be with you. See, that's what you want. You want a man that believes that God has put you in his life because you are the one. We all have a one. Believe it or not. Believe it or not. And when we get that one, when we find that one, it is a blessing because that one strengthens us. That one lifts us up when we need to be lifted. That one makes us better. That one completes us. God knows that that one is the one that can, can improve our relationship with him. So women, now that you know what to look for in a man, what, men, what do we need to look for? What, what does a man need to look for as far as a woman goes? And I can't think of anything better 
than Proverbs 31. Now, Proverbs 31. Now, this is interesting, okay? There's a rumor. There's a rumor that this was actually written to Samuel. Not Samuel. Oh, my gosh. I just said it wrong. It could have been written to Samuel, though, because they don't know for sure. But it wasn't written to Samuel. There's a rumor that it was written to Solomon by Bathsheba. Bathsheba was, was, was Solomon's mom. You see, Solomon, he loved a lot of things. Now, at the beginning, Solomon loved the Lord because that's what David instilled in him. And I mean, he even prayed to the Lord. He said, I don't want money. I don't want fame. I don't want riches. All I want is wisdom so that I can run this nation. Because he was a kid. And God was so impressed with that. He said, I don't want I'm going to give you the wisdom. I'm going to give you those other things that you said you didn't want. Well, Solomon found something else that he liked too. Women. He had over 700 wives and concubines. Yeah. No wonder he was always tired. Anyway, <laughs> over 700 wives and concubines. And they weren't, weren't all from Israel. So what ended up happening is the Lord that, that, that Solomon said that he loved, the Lord that, that Solomon gave his heart to at the very beginning, got put on the back burner because of the women that Solomon was with. And Solomon ended up worshiping false gods and ripping the kingdom of Israel, tearing it. So there was a southern kingdom and a northern kingdom, Judah and Israel. All because of Solomon's love of women. Now there is some, some uh, textual and external evidence that holds, that helps to, to, to say that it was Bathsheba that wrote this to King Solomon. I do not know 100% and neither does anyone else. However, in my mind and in my heart, I like to think of her writing that to him. Because I could see it. This isn't on the, or going to be on the screen. This isn't what I was started out with. But, you know, as you look at verse 2 in, in, in Proverbs 31, it says, What are you doing, my son? What are you doing, son of my womb? See, she sees him going after all these women that are not godly women. She sees him chasing after the women that, that, are, that are just rich or the women that are just pretty or the women that are just this or the women that are just that. He's not looking at the total package. He's picking out individual things that he likes about each woman. And he's like, come into my home. And what happens is the home is getting tainted. The home is getting polluted. The beliefs that are not of the Lord are being brought into that home. So what does she think that that woman should look like? What does the woman, the, the, the woman look like? Now remember, this woman was married to David. Now, the way that they got married was not necessarily biblical. But David was a man of God. And here's what she says. Starting with verse 10. An excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life, and seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant and brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it, and with the fruit of her hands, plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when she sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. 
Strength and dignity are her clothing. And she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom. And the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household. And does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also and he praises her. Many women have done excellently. But you surpass them all. Charm is defeat, deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Long story short, she's telling him, charm is deceitful. Beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Don't let her words be what praises her. Don't let her beauty be what praises her. Let her actions be what praises her. The woman that wrote that proverb wants a woman of God to be at her son's side. A woman who takes the interest of her husband and her family first. A woman who is not afraid to sacrifice for her household. A woman who is there for her husband and lifting him up in good times and in bad. A woman who is not just there for the good time, but is there for the full time. A woman who is willing to put up with his mistakes and willing to correct him when he is wrong. A woman who will truly strengthen him and a woman who will make him better. See, as we look at all of those verses, this is what we need to get from our relationships. Man or woman, is the person that we are with a man or woman of God? That's the first question. Are you with someone who loves the Lord above all others? Because if you're not, that relationship is not going to be successful. Because if they don't love the Lord first, guess who they do love first? Themselves. It ain't you. As many kind words and flowers and trinkets they may buy you, they love themselves more than they love you. So when you are looking for that person, make sure that they love the Lord first and foremost. Second question we need to ask is, does the person that I'm with make me better? Huh. We all have places that we fall short in our life. I will tell you that my wife makes me better in so many places. And there's many places that she tries to make me better that I just ignore a lot of times. But she makes me better nonetheless. She makes me better because why does she make me better? Because she wants to see me better. See, the easy route is divorce. And in America, we've made divorce just fine. It's okay to divorce your wife. It's okay to leave because it doesn't work out. If you find that man or woman who, one, believes in God, and two, makes you better, there will be no divorce. And then the last thing that we need to look at, and I know that this is, you may want to put earmuffs. Is it more than just physical love? See, so many times we fall into the trap of just saying, okay, well, this is good. And then we wind up in a relationship that becomes that relationship of convenience. It's hard to leave because we have officially yoked ourselves to that person. It really comes down to what is important to you. Is God important enough to you that you will choose a mate that is pleasing to him? Think about that. And if you choose a mate that is pleasing to him, you will find happiness. You will find peace. You will find joy. A relationship is not something that you have to have. Being single is just fine. As a matter of fact, Paul said that it's better to be that way. 
It's better to be single and allow the one to come into your life than it is to try everyone before you find the one, which is the method that I see most often. So this week, look at the relationships in your lives. Look at the man or the woman that you say I love you to each and every day and see if that's the person that God wants you to be with. You'll know the answer. You'll probably know the answer the first time you ask the question. Many of you probably know the answer right now. You're not doing anyone favors by being in relationships that are not pleasing to the Lord. We're hurting ourselves. We're hurting our partners. And most of all, we're hurting God. God doesn't want to see us unhappy. God doesn't want to see us abused. God doesn't want to see us in that place of torment. God doesn't want to see us as we get in the car every morning. What am I doing? God wants us to be in that car when we leave for work in the morning and be like, I can't wait to get home to this person. Let all things be pleasing to the Lord and give all things with an open hand and understand that he has the best, the best for you. Y'all did? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for the love that you put in our lives, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the partners that you have ordained for us since the beginning of time, Lord. And Lord, we pray that as we, as we build these relationships that we do so properly, I pray that each and every one of us understand what love really looks like and that love truly starts with you, Lord. Lord, let us put you in first and foremost in every aspect of our lives, Lord, and allow us to seek you knowing that, that the relationship that we have with you is going to bleed into every other relationship that we have on this earth, Lord. Allow our relationships to be strengthened, allow our hearts to be full, and allow us to desire you above all others. And Lord, if there's anyone here whose heart is crying out for you right now, if there's anyone here whose, whose heart has been opened to the Holy Spirit, if there is anyone here who is ready to receive you, Lord, let them receive you now, Lord. Let them pray this prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sin, Lord. Come into my heart and save me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit till it overflows, for I know that your son went to that cross and died for me. And the precious blood that he spilled and atones for my sins, past, present, and future, as he was on that criminal's cross, he gave himself back to the Father. And he was put into a borrowed grave. The grave which he defeated on the third day when he rose. Defeating the world and defeating all evil. From there he walked this earth for 40 days. In front of many witnesses. Sharing himself and his message with all those who had received. Until finally, in front of over 500 witnesses, he ascended into heaven, where he now sits on the right-hand side of the Father as my advocate, loving me when I can't be loved, defending me when I'm indefensible, desiring me to know him better when I turn away, and loving me through all situations. I give myself, I give my heart to Jesus Christ, who is my Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. If you have said that prayer, or if you need prayer, if you need anything, let us know. The altar is open.
Today is a very special day. Um, when we profess our, our love for Jesus Christ and we give our lives to the Lord, one of the things that we do is we give ourselves to the Lord in the uh, ceremony of holy baptism. We baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is representative of uh, us dying with Christ, us rising with Christ, and it's also a public profession of our faith. Now, we have two young men that are going to be baptized today, and they were saved the moment that they said, Jesus Christ, you were my Lord and Savior. They were saved before this baptism. Um, as far as I know, they have not spoken in tongues or anything. Any tongues been spoken? Nothing? Nothing? Still saved. Guess what? Still saved. See, it is Jesus Christ's blood that saves us. It is not the speaking of tongues. It is not this that is about to happen. What it is is that our love for Jesus Christ and his love for us, that is the only reason that we are saved. Don't let someone fool you and lie to you right. and say that you have to do something other than accept Jesus Christ. Right. Now, I'm not diminishing the importance of the holy baptism because we were instructed by Jesus Christ to do that. We were instructed to baptize in the name of the Father, baptize in the name of the Son, baptize in the name of the Holy Spirit, and what? Make disciples. See, that's where we run into a, a, a problem. See, a lot of places want to put a notch on the wall. We baptized 527 this year, like McDonald's. 60 billion served. But guess what? They're not making disciples. So as these men come up here and they give their lives and they profess their love for Jesus Christ, I charge you, the congregation, to hold them accountable. Why? Because when you love Jesus Christ, when Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you are held to a higher standard. Amen. You think that, 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 that coming and, 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 and receiving a certain job or receiving a certain title at work holds you to a higher standard. Nothing holds you to a higher standard than Jesus Christ. You have been called. Jesus Christ chose these two men to work within his kingdom. Man. And if Jesus Christ chose you and you've done this and you have accepted him as your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ charged you with making him disciples. It is not just my job. Yeah. Because when we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, not all the old things are erased. We've got to learn a whole new way of life. I didn't go from junkie to pastor overnight. There was a lot of failure along the way. There were some trips to the Suboxone Clinic. <laughs> what? There were. There were some trips. There was some relapse in there. There was, there was some fights. Yeah, some real fights. 
There were some disagreements with my wife, my helpmate, my, my number one, the one that was put into my life because I was not obedient at all times. But I had people in my life that brought me to that place of discipleship and allowed me to get to where I am today, which is far from perfect. Far from perfect. But we all have the ability to instruct. We know what God wants us to do. So if you see these guys slipping up, if you see these guys doing something that they're not supposed to do, don't blast, just don't blast it on Facebook. So-and-so says that he loves Jesus Christ and I just saw him do this. Pull him aside. Say, look, that's not what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. This is how you handle that situation. You're not the judge and you're not the jury. And these men have already accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Guess what? They have been saved by the blood of Jesus and their sins have been washed away past, present, and future. Amen. Now, I'm going to have to do the baptism a little different today. Pastor Pete is ill and he's been quarantined for 14 days. I know, that's no good. So be in prayer for Pastor Pete. Which means that I can't go downstairs and, and really hold them under the water until the bubbles stop like I want to. Them. That's really the only way to get the evil out of them. Bubbles stop and it comes out. Let me see. Yeah, I've got my CPR guy here, Michael. That's our mouth to mouth guy at work. We, we say, all right, if something's down, better call Michael. So, anyway. Anyway, but we are going to continue with the baptism. But why are we going to do that? We're going to do it because we don't delay on things like that. When you say you want to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I believe we've got one baptism right now. So, Michael, if you would please come up to the front. Amen. I love this guy. I love this guy. Let me, let, me tell you, let me tell you just a little bit about this guy. I don't know. I'm not going to go into his past or anything like that. But before he came into the program and before he came into this church, I don't think he really knew what the body of Christ looked like. I think that he had some presuppositions and some false narratives that were going on in his mind. He thought that there were things that he had done. He thought that the things that the way that he looked or the way that he acted in the past, they thought that they would, he thought that he would be frowned upon by the congregation and by, by God's people. But guess what? God's people love you. They do. And thank you, church. Thank you, church, for showing him the love of Christ so that he could feel Christ in his heart. Because Christ has been working on him his entire life, just like he has y'all. But he felt the love of Jesus Christ because y'all showed him the love of Jesus Christ. So thank you. Thank you, congregation. We appreciate you for that. Now, I'm going to ask you some questions. They're not true false, so you may have trouble. With, I'm just kidding. They're, they're, they are not true false, though, but uh, they're yes, no. So um, this, is what we will, this is what we will do. We're going to ask the questions. Do you turn away from Satan and all the spiritual forces of evil that rebel against God? All right. Do you turn away from all sinful desires that draw you away from fellowship with God? Do you turn to Jesus Christ? Do you intend to be a faithful follower of Christ, serving him by obeying his word and showing the saving grace that he has given you in your life? Do you promise to devote yourself to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers? Praise God. Michael asks you if you will come here. Michael, I baptize you in the name of the Father. I baptize you in the name of the Son. We baptize you in the name of the Holy Spirit. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this man. I thank you for what you are doing in Michael's life, and I thank you for the changes that are coming, Lord. Lord, I pray that the influence that he carries continues to, to spread, Lord. Lord, he has such a joy in his heart. We know that he is going to be a mighty evangelist. We know that he is going to be a mighty man of God. We know that people are going to see the change in his life and know that it's only you, Lord. Lord, be with this man through the difficult times. Lift him up, Lord. Allow us as a church to support him in his growth, Lord. Let us walk side by side with him as he understands and grows in his relationship with you, Lord. And allow him to glorify you with his word, with his action, and with his deed, Lord. Lord, we, we love you. 
and we love the, the disciples that you send our way, Lord. Thank you for sending Michael through these doors. Thank you for putting him in our lives, Lord. May he learn from us and we learn from him. And may all of our teachings come from you. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. 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 I love you, brother. The power of Jesus Christ and the love that he has is so amazing. It's incredible. Um, before we close out service, we always do our prayer requests and we do our announcements. Um, as far as announcements go this week, uh, Tuesday, the uh, adult education will be back here. Um, we got to gotta call you out, brother. Got to call you out. How many weeks were you in that class? Four, four weeks. He went and took his test for his high school diploma, and he has passed every section and is just waiting on the English grade to come back. But his English teacher is very confident. So, someone who's been waiting to get their high school diploma for 25 years comes and after four weeks is blessed with that. You know why? Because he was willing to move and he was willing to get it. God put the opportunity in front of him and he struck. And he went out and he got it. Don't be afraid to go after those opportunities that God puts before you. I'm so proud of you. So proud of you. So that's on Tuesdays and on Thursdays, 5 o'clock to 7.30. The, 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 the young ladies that teach the class, they're not bad. Well, Debbie's bad. Debbie's bad. No, I'm just kidding. Debbie's not bad. Debbie's actually wonderful. She's been an English teacher for over 40 years, uh, retired, widowed, and uh, still giving back to the community. So praise God for Debbie. Um, so we've got that on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Tuesday, we have a gratitude meeting here at the church. Uh, we didn't have it this week because of the situation with Pastor Pete. It is a 12-step gratitude meeting. D-A-A, N-A, A-A, A-A. Uh, Triple A if your car has problems. No. All the initials, all the initials are welcome. Um, what, what it does is, is we get together and we talk about the great things that God has done in our lives and the way that we are working the steps through God. It gives you a chance to glorify God. Did you get through step four by yourself? Pretty sure God was with you. Pretty sure God was with you. I, my resentments were not fun. So understand that, 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 that this is an opportunity to glorify God, and it does count as one of your meetings. If, you're, if you have to go to meetings, we'll sign a piece of paper for you. Um, I pray that that's not the reason you come, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. Um, Wednesday, we have online Bible study at 7 p.m. Um, it's basically a long-winded pastor sitting down and talking about the book of Leviticus. Uh, but he's handsome. He's handsome, and he's got an alligator on his desk. Check in just for the alligator. See if I'm lying to you. All right. So um, other than that, uh, the fourth, fourth Sunday, which is not this Sunday, but I believe it will be the 30, I believe it will be the 26th or the 25th. I believe the 25th will be the fourth Sunday. Fourth Sunday, we'll be back over at uh, Loaves and Fishes, Feeding the Homeless. Man, you talk about an opportunity. Uh Michael, who I just baptized, uh, he showed up and he knew a bunch of the guys from his past life, and he got an opportunity to tell them what God's doing, and uh, I know that he made a change in those men's lives. So this is an opportunity for you to come and share your wisdom and your knowledge of God. So don't be afraid to do so. Um, Nikki, is there any... If, yes, if we could put our chairs in the carts and those tables in that back room because Awana's is tonight. It's going to be a bunch of little kids running around here breaking all our stuff. It's going to be awesome. Um, <laughs> seriously. Um, other than that, I can't think of any announcements. But, uh, man, we love y'all. We appreciate y'all. Let's be in prayer for all of our, our, our brothers and sisters who aren't here today. Um, Keely uh, wanted us to pray for uh, her papa who isn't doing well, um, her nana, every nation, the sick, the homeless, and guidance for herself. 
Shirley and Craig, uh, praise. Three of their kids are in church today. Praise God. And pray for, uh, pray for my other two, Jimmy Laws. Pray for Jimmy Laws. Uh, pray for work. Uh, pray for me and Nikki and Sadie. Uh, pray for the homeless, uh, her sisters and brothers, our nation, all nations and church family. Understand that our church family extends to all nations. And there are nations where the church cannot meet like this. Where the church cannot meet like this because it's illegal. They'll be imprisoned or possibly killed. Understand how good you have it to be able to worship Jesus Christ the way you do. Eric, you have a prayer request? Uh, yes, please. Uh, pray for my son Dalton and my aunt Helen. Uh, my uncle Charles passed uh, about a week ago, and uh, my, my son's not doing great with his body. Well, we certainly will be in prayer. Be in prayer for his son Dalton and Emma. No, my aunt Helen. Helen. Dalton and Helen. Uh, Uncle Charles passed away. Dalton's not dealing with it well. And I mean, that's tough. When you're young, death is... Yes? Pray for his dad, Mark Ferguson, and his mom. And just pray that they get everything together. And be in prayer for Cody. Because Cody's one of those guys that's making a change. And uh, he's really working. And uh, he's trying to do what he's supposed to do. And you know, that, that's the thing about it. When we're on the road to doing what we're supposed to do... The devil will put as many things in our way as possible. You know why? Because the devil knows what we like. He does. He doesn't have the power that God has. He can't be everywhere. He can't do all things. He can't, he can't even take life. But the thing about it is, the devil knows man. Why? Because the devil's been around a long time. Your weakness, it's been around for thousands of years. My weakness, been around for thousands of years. People have been the same. As we read through scripture, we see that, that, that there are very, very, very many parallels that we can draw to the past to now. So be aware of that. Uh, Katie, be uh, in prayer for her dad and her Uncle Randy. Be in prayer for Miss Suzanne and uh, Stephanie. That's from Nikki. Also be in prayer for Nikki. Be in prayer uh, for, uh, for our family and uh, the adjustments that we've made with the, the, the little Sadie coming in. Man, she's tough too. Nikki looked at her the other day. Y'all may have seen it on Facebook. And Nikki said, you want a piece of me? And Sadie was like, I'm not scared. And, and then Sadie also headbutted her this week. So I don't know where she's learning it. Um, Aaron, uh, for the Tyree family, Sabrina, pray for her boss. Uh, she had a, a brain aneurysm. Um, she was flown to UT for brain surgery. She has made it out and needs a speedy recovery. Um, an unspoken prayer request. Pray for Katie and her family. It's being prayer for Katie McIver. Uh, she lost her father this weekend. Um, it's always tough when you lose a parent. I did speak with her yesterday, and uh, she seems to be doing well. She's surrounded by family and friends, but, uh, but it's never easy. So let's uh, keep all of these prayer requests in mind, and uh, let's take them with us throughout the week. The Lord knows the unspoken request, and uh, don't be afraid to pray for each other. And, and guys... Don't be afraid to pray for yourself. You've got to pray for yourself. Let's close out. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we close out this service, I pray that you do with each and every individual here, Lord. Protect us as we go out. and we, we, we glorify you this week, Lord. Forgive us for where we fall short. Lift us up. And Lord, we pray that we feel that joy that comes when we are in your favor. Lord, put a hedge of protection around us so that we may not be attacked, so that we may not receive what it is that the world is sending our way. Allow us to be brave and allow us to be bold in you. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen.